There's two answers. The church and or us. Me personally, not, not just me, but each one of us, when we are, um, uh, when we realize who our heavenly bridegroom is, um, he's our personal savior, right? Um, but also collectively as the church, he is the bridegroom of the church. <coughs> and this is actually, if you remember, the, the reading that we, we recite in the wedding ceremony, okay, from Ephesians chapter 5. The king of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, and he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Okay? Again, he sent out other servants, telling those who are invited, See, I have repaired my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and things are ready. Come to the wedding. So how many invitations so far? Right? And this is intentional because in the old days, the Jewish custom for their wedding was that they would have two invitations. Like the first one was more like, we're going to get married on such, such a date, save the date. Right? <laughs> and then the day of, they would kind of warn you, okay, it's, they didn't have an exact time of when it would start because there were a lot of um, preliminary um, things that had to take place. Um, the groom would do something with his entourage of friends and, and the bride as well. Um, and so, and one of the things that they would do is the groom would gather all the people around from the city and then go to the bride and then they would have the ceremony. So <coughs> you knew it was going to be on this day, but you didn't know exactly what time. And actually many of the events started from, from the night before. Anyway, um, so the fathers teach us that this first invitation is with the prophets, that Christ is coming, the bridegroom is coming, right? And then the final call was more like John the Baptist, right? Prepare the way of the Lord, make his way straight. Okay, um, again, this is based on what the church fathers say. Um, so Gregory the Great, um, uh, uh, from I guess you can say the seventh century, I believe. He says, uh, God the Father made a marriage for a feast for his son by joining the church to him through the mystery of his incarnation. So, so the unity happens when Christ took flesh, when he took our form, okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's why the prophets are the ones preparing ahead of time, but the day of, it's, it's on the incarnation. He truly came forth like a bridegroom from his bridal chamber, this is a reference for the Holy Virgin Mary. We even call her this in, in some of the hymns. And he sent his servants twice. So this is the first invitation with, with two parts, okay? Um, because he said through the prophets that his only son incarnation would take place, right? So the prophets announced the first time, and then right before, he says, um, the apostles and, and John the Baptist, of course, that it had, come, it had taken place. Okay, um, <coughs> so that's just the beginning of the parable to set up the story. And then what's the response? What do you think the response is? Not a good one, right? They made light of it. And so these are the people invited. Who, who, do, who do you think these are pertaining to specifically in the church or in the history? Jewish the Jewish people, very good. So they were the first ones, right? They made light of it, went their way, one to his own farm, another to his own business, and the rest sees his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them, right? Just like they killed the prophets, and then uh, at the end, they killed his only begotten son, okay? And this is similar to some other parables as well, okay? Um, so j just like they rejected the first invitation, the Jewish nation rejected the invitation of believing in the Lord Christ. But also, we sometimes reject the Lord and his kingdom when we refrain from f accepting his invitation um, in, in our daily life. Um, even in the gospel, like he came to his own and his own did not receive him, right? Some t we are his own. Of course, back then they thought that his own were just the people th th of Israel, um, but they did not receive him, right? But he also comes to us and oftentimes we don't receive him in the way that 
he deserves. Why? Because if you look at the rejection here, there's three different levels of the rejection. They made light of it, right? First one. Um, one to his own farm, another to his business. So they went away, right, to do their, their daily work, right? Um, I have more important things to do, the other priorities. And the third thing, they, they attacked his servants, right? <clears throat> so sometimes we do the same thing. Um, some of the fathers equate this with um, the three negative responses that are also given um, in or the three temptations that are given um, by the devil um, to the Lord on, uh, during his, his fast in the wilderness, right? So we say, when we ignore it or make light of it, it's because why we, we love ourselves or we love the pleasure. We don't want to sacrifice, right? Or um, they went away to their own business. They got distracted with the love of, of, of money or the materialism. And the last one is the love of, of the self. Um, so like uh, I think it's St. John, he says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The three different categories of the hedonism, materialism, and pride. Um, <clears throat> and so this is probably what one of these things is what prevents us from accepting the invitation of uniting with our Lord on a daily basis. Um, okay. Uh, Archbishop Dimitri, an Orthodox uh, bishop, wrote this. He actually collected, um, this is what inspired us to, to start the series, is this book on parables, where he kind of breaks them all down and, and gives some collection of responses from the, from the fathers on this. But interesting enough, he says, if we are honest, we have little difficulty in seeing ourselves in the people who made light of it and went their ways. So a lot of us make light of it and went our way. Uh, all too often, we also go rather to our farms and to our merchandise or to our business, whatever form these might take in our own city. What are else are we doing besides the spiritual growth? What is taking us away? The difference between us and the invited guests in the parable is that we tend to justify our negligence. We say that we're very busy, but we also seem to think that the other areas of our life are of equal if not greater importance. Some of us reason that it is not so much the Lord himself who laid these hard requirements on us as it is other men, particularly the clergy. Oh, I have to go to church because Abuna is forcing me to go to church. So no, God, God wants you to go to church. <laughs> I have to read the Bible because my father of confession said, no, or my servant said, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an encouragement to do the right things, right? Just like the, in the parable here, they, they beat and spitefully treated the servants, but their main attack was, was not with the servants, but with the, the father and the son. <coughs> uh, so here the guests in the parable rejected the invitation outright. Actually, that's, that's a good thing sometimes because God wants us to be uh, hot or cold. So they were being cold. He says, we seem to think that we can accept or reject according to our mood and that everything will still be all right. Um, <clears throat> our problem seems to be, he continues, in spite of what the Lord himself said, that we find no conflict between serving God and mammon, or this world. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, it's a little harsh message, but I think this time at the end of the year, um, the church kind of intentionally, so two times a year usually, it's at the end of the year, and Passion Week is where the, the most um, hard to accept messages uh, the church organizes for us for our repentance. Okay. Um, then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy, right? Um, the people who, the first time, they rejected. They were not worthy because they chose not to be worthy, okay? They didn't accept the call. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So what is this? Symbolically, it's not hard to figure out, right? It's the Gentile nation, right? Because if the Jews rejected, then everyone, um, of course, this was the divine plan. But it's also to remind us of those who at f are Christians first doesn't mean God is not opening the door to others to be Christians. And sometimes the ones who come later are better than the ones who came earlier. 
So those servants went out to the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. Well, why? Some people say, why didn't he just invite the good and not the bad? Because it's not just a matter of invitation or it's not just a matter of entering the door, but what happens after you enter the door. <laughs> because once you enter the door and unite with the, the groom, you're going to be changed. You're going to be good. So he takes us as he are, we are in the beginning, but he changes us to be more like him. That's the whole purpose of the church. Um, <coughs> and the wedding hall was filled with guests, just like sometimes the church is filled with people. But then he says, um, the Lord did not c come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. So he came for all. But, um, but both bad and good, um, again, Gregory the Great writes, he says, the church is a thorough mix. He says, even in the church, we have good and not so good people. Um, of course, we're all trying to be good, but some people might be trying harder than others. And he says, and it brings them all to the faith, but it doesn't lead them all to the liberty of spiritual grace successfully. Why, does that mean the church is a failure? No, it's because not everyone continues to respond to the call. Um, <coughs> uh, because, he says, their sins prevent it. Um, this life is situated between heaven and hell. It goes in the middle, so to speak, and it takes the citizens of both parts. But the church admits them now without distinguishing them, but separates them later when they leave this life. Just like the Lord says, I will separate. It's another parable. Hopefully, we'll get to it when he separates the sheep and the goats, right? <coughs> the ones on the right and the ones on the left. The ones on the right are not just the ones who are baptized, because there are many people who are baptized that might not enter the kingdom of heaven, just like he called the 12 disciples, but not all of them were saved, right? Um, uh, okay, so uh, then what happened after this? The king came in to see the guests. So, so again, the first call, they rejected, right? The second call was, was more open to more people, bad and good, but that's not the end of the story. Then the king enters and he takes a look at everyone around, right? Um, he saw one person who didn't have a wedding garment. He said to him, how did you come in? First he calls him friend, just like the Lord calls Judas friend, right? Um, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? If I were him, I would say, well, you just told me last minute, I wasn't invited, I was on the street, and you came. But he didn't respond because he knew better, right? Um, so the first group made light of the invitation. This guy made light of the garment. He probably thought he could get away with it. <laughs> um, back in the day, they had to have separate garments that were for, kind of like, you know, your Sunday best, like when, we tried to keep this custom, you know, in the church over over the centuries. Um, but the idea here is to put on your best when you come to see the Lord. And the fathers explained this to be primarily um, the, the garment of baptism. He <coughs> um, says when you're in the church, you should have the garment of baptism. You should be a, have the ability to keep your garment clean through the rest of the sacraments, right? <coughs> um, like in the book of Revelation, um, the the righteous who have their robes white, um, how are they white? Because they were washed in the blood of the Lamb um, through the sacraments, through the death and resurrection of Christ, which we have through baptism, repentance, uh, and confession and communion. That's what keeps the garment white. Um, and uh, Saint John Chrysostom says. We don't keep the garments white because we're not diligent enough to, to do that cycle, or especially the repentance. Um, okay, so this garment, I think we'll, we'll just take a few more uh, minutes to, to focus on this because it means a multitude of things. Um, like uh, the garment of righteousness, like is mentioned in, uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 61, um, the Lord, uh, uh, he says, I will rejoice, greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. So God is the one who gives us joy. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. So this is the garment that the guy didn't have. He didn't put on Christ. Um, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness 
as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. So here he's cut, he's relating again baptism with um, clothing, with um, the marriage. What, what happened to Adam and Eve? They tried to clothe themselves with things um, that were not from God, but from the the earth, from from the plants, from the fig um, the tree, and. It, it w didn't suffice because Christ wants us to clothe us with himself. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, this is what happens. Um, actually, there's another couple of Psalms that we pray, Psalm 29 and Psalm 92. Um, in 92, it says, the Lord reigns. He has clothed himself with honor. The Lord has girded himself with strength. Anyone know, um, especially the deacons, when do we pray this prayer? Uh, the Lord, it's 29 and 92. We actually have them up in the altar. Um, the Lord has girded himself with strength. Um, the Lord has clothed himself with honor. When we're putting on the white garment, on the tonia, right? This goes for the priest and the deacon. Um, <coughs> and so why? Um, and actually, I mean, we probably know this, right? But the, the priest or the deacon is not allowed to wear that garment anywhere else. Another church, yes, but not outside. They can't go to the store with it. But it's only for <laughs> the altar, right? Um, and we can't go, actually, we shouldn't go in the altar without the garment or, or some covering. Why? Because we have to put on Christ. We have to be clothed in him before doing his work. Um, <clears throat> and this is what Pope Krillos uh, uh, of Blessed Memory says, we have to disappear in God. Um, that he, that God may be manifested in His glory, um, and uh, 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 Abuna Tedros Melody he says uh, not only the priest but the whole church, as a priestly nature, has to put on these um, holy garments. Um, okay, so when we do this, it's it happens. It starts in baptism, but it continues to be cleansed throughout. Um, throughout the rest of our spiritual growth. Um, so uh, St. Augustine, he writes, all the faithful know the story of the marriage of the king's son, this, this parable. They know that the Lord's table is open to all who are willing to correctly receive it, just like everyone was invited into the banquet. But it is important that each one examines how he approaches, even when he is not forbidden to approach. So, so no one's going to stand at the door anymore and say, no, you can't enter, <laughs> right? Maybe in COVID <laughs> it happened or possibly. But um, in the early days, they used to say, oh, you're not Christian, you can't enter. Or um, uh, you, you have to stay for a period of repentance and confession back in the day if they committed a, a gr grievous sin, um, like adultery or abortion or whatever. Um, the the church would tell them you, you can't take communion for a period of time, um, sometimes up to like 10 years. So they would have to, they would not be allowed in the church. They would have to stay right outside of the church. That's how strict they were. Um, but now St. Saint, uh, Augustine is saying, even if you're allowed in, that doesn't mean we're, we're clear to approach God in a proper way. He says, the feast of which you have now heard when the gospel was being read has both good and evil guests, like we were saying, both good and bad. All who excuse themselves from this feast are evil, but not all those who entered in are good. Um, we make mistakes in, 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 in the church, even though we are trying to live a holy life. Um, <clears throat> that's why we have to continually be repenting and to wash these garments. Um, he says, now I address you, therefore, who are the good guests at this feast. You are taking careful note of the words. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, eats and drinks judgment to him. This is scary, but this is what um, St. Paul says in the, to the Corinthians. If you drink in an unworthy manner, manner the, the blood of Christ, or you partake of communion without being properly prepared, it's, it, instead of helping us, it hurts us. Um, so that's why he's saying, I, I plead you not to look um, vainly at, at this uh, sacrament. Um, oh, yeah, he continues. Give ear to this, all you have partaken of the Eucharist. Um, 
and though present at the wedding, have clothed your soul in filthy behavior. Hear what you were called from. You were called from the streets. <laughs> yes, we were all called from the streets. In what condition? Um, disabled in soul, he says. Show respect for the love of the one who called you, and let no one persist in wearing filthy clothing. Instead, let each of us be concerned about how the soul is dressed. Um, listen, women, listen, men. Our need is not for garments that are spangled with gold, but those on the inside. While we have the former, it is difficult to put on the latter. It is not possible to deck out both soul. So for spending, let's, I mean, I don't think anyone here is, in, but like, you know, back in the day, or some people, they, they spend like, how many hours do you spend to get ready for like work? <laughs> I, I don't think it's like two, three hours, but some, some people are like that, right? <laughs> okay, let's just say it's, I don't know, an hour. Okay, and how many, t how, how much do we spend in getting ready for church. Uh, well, I abbreviate <laughs> that that <laughs> um, physical dress, but do we, are we doing any spiritual dress? So, um, so um, this is what we call the not just the repent the confession, but the the daily repentance. Uh, we can prepare ourselves also with prayer. Um, we prepare ourselves with contemplation or through spiritual reading. Um, oh, I'm going to read the Bible in the church. Yeah, but. It doesn't have as much effect if, if we're not as, as prepared. Okay. Um, so then St. John Chrysostom gives, we're almost done. He gives this example of um, if anyone so comes to your house and starts decorating it with like gold draperies, right? Um, but then he makes you sit in rags or naked, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take it lightly, right? Um, he says, this is what we're doing to ourselves. We're decorating the the gold draperies but of the body, but we're letting the soul in rags. Um, of course, I'm, I'm not saying this to anyone, I say this first to myself, but this is just what um, we have to remember before we um, prepare ourselves for, for the great wedding banquet, which is the communion. He says, do you not realize the king should be adorned more than the city? So he's calling the city the body, and the king is the mind or the heart. Um, so. We have to enlighten our mind um, more than the, than the body. He says, don't you understand you are invited to a wedding, God's wedding? Uh, don't you give thought how the soul that is invited into these chambers should enter clothed in golden tassels um, in rich variety? So this is what God is looking for. God is looking for the garment of the soul um, to be clothed day by day. The more we um, pray, the more we struggle in the spiritual life, the more we fill ourselves with, with the spiritual things, the more we uh, clothe our spirits or our souls um, with, with these jewels, with this adornment, with this gold. Um, and, and that's why St. Mary is above all. She had, she had all of the, the adornment um, on the inside more than on the out. Um, so this is our goal, God willing, for for uh, for our preparation, not only for the next time we take communion, but um, the more we practice this preparation, the, the more we find things that need to be fine-tuned. Like, um, you know, like the, uh, the women who like they say, I'm gonna go get a makeover. Okay, how long will that take? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. But I'm sure there's like, okay, first we do the hair and then we fix, it's not just the hair, but you have to fix all these different things and then straighten or like, it, it becomes a science, like <laughs> where you have to get a degree in order to, to practice. And it's not just the hair, but, and then there's the eyebrow and then there's <laughs> I don't, like, uh, anyway. But so you, the more you get into it, the more you're like, oh, that's not perfect. Let me try to fix it. Um, what can I do about it? What are some different uh, things that I can try, right? So we can try to, to take the same methodology for the spiritual life. Um, and we don't do it alone. Like we have our spiritual guides. We have the fathers, um, we, the church fathers. Um, we have the church to help us, or at least we have the saints to say, oh, they're beautiful. How do, how do I get like that? What do they do? Uh, who did they go to? <laughs> um, so this is, this is the, the spirit of the growth. Um, finally, in the last um, verse, the Lord says, for many are called, but few are chosen. God invites everyone 
to heaven. He invites everyone to the church. He invites everyone to be baptized. Um, but that doesn't mean they're all going to be chosen for the kingdom. Um, and this choice is not God's choice, but it's our choice. It depends on us based on what we do with the invitation, based on how we reply to God's invitation. Um, were we called? Yes, we were called. Did we accept? Most of us, yes, have accepted Christ in our life. Do we have the garment? Yes, we're baptized. Is the garment on? Maybe. Is it, is it, here's the thing, is it clean? <laughs> um, there's one story, um, I can't remember where I, I read this, of one of the bishops who had like a near-death experience, and he had a vision, um, or he was being translated basically uh, to, to paradise. And he saw himself in a white garment, but then there were some black spots. And he was trying to like rub it off and clean it. He couldn't do, he couldn't do it. <laughs> um, well, that's it was scary. And this bishop was like a very righteous, um, I, I, I can't remember his name. Um, but like just that idea of, uh, the idea of trying to clean our garment here this is where we do all of that laundering in the blood of the Lamb. Um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, we end with the, the encouragement in the book of Revelation, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, for again, our, our robes will be whitened by cleansing them in his blood. Glory be to him now from today, to age Amen. Any questions or comments? It's a small parable, but nevertheless, it, it brings forth a lot of, just like all of them, there's a lot of depth to it, to each of, of the parables, and that's why this is a good opportunity um, to dissect them one by one. But the more you'll see, they'll all be interlinking with, um, with the same big message. Any questions? Okay, we'll pray. <clears throat>